years ago before there was uh, as much technology as we have today, the captain of a battleship remained on the bridge throughout the night because of the fog, uh, the heavy fog that had set in. And suddenly the lookout on the wing reported light bearing on the starboard bow. And then, uh, is it steady or of moving astern? The captain called out and the lookout replied, steady captain, which meant that they were on a collision course if they were going to continue to go in the direction that they were going. And so the captain called out to the signal man. He said, signal that ship and tell them that we're on a collision course and that they need to move uh, 20 degrees to the right. Well, back, uh, they signaled back and it said advisable for you to change your course 20 degrees. Well, that made the captain mad on the ship. And he said, I am a captain, change 20 degrees. And the other, then it came back across there. I am a seaman second class. You make sure or change course 20 degrees. And then the captain was even madder then. He spat it out. He said, I am a battleship. And then it came back, I am a lighthouse. And so the battleship had to turn 20 degrees. But we are the battleship. When you think about that story today, and the Lord is the lighthouse. Um, it is we who are going to move. It is not God. And I would tell you that when we rebel against the Lord, we are on a collision course with spiritual disaster. There is spiritual disaster coming when we do not obey what God tells us to do. Our only, our only hope is acknowledging God's authority, change course, and line up with what God's will is for our life. That's our only course that we can take. That's the only direction that we can go. Now, this is the message of the book of Jonah here. I would tell you that the book of Jonah is not, uh, it's not about the fish that swallowed Jonah. It's not about that. The fish is mentioned four times. It is not about Nineveh, which is mentioned nine times. It's not even about Jonah here in the scripture, uh, even, the, even though the book is named after him. Jonah is mentioned 18 times in the scripture here. But the book of Jonah is about the Lord God, and he is mentioned there uh, 38 times in these four chapters that we'll be speaking about over the next uh, several weeks. It reveals... When we speak about um, the Lord God here, it reveals two uh, attributes of God. Jonah reveals the mercy of God. That's the first thing that we're going to see, the attribute of the Lord, the mercy of God. We see God's micro -mer mercy in dealing with the rebellious prophet Jonah here. But then we see God's macro mercy in dealing with the sinful people of Nineveh. Uh, the second thing we see is Jonah reveals the sovereignty of God. Uh, the mercy of God, then the sovereignty of God. That great writer of day gone by, Arthur Pink, said, divine um, sovereignty simply means that God is God. I think that's a pretty good definition. Indeed, God has made us free moral agents to choose whether we want to obey or disobey God. God made us free moral agents to, to be that way. But do not overemphasize that choice because human free will is limited. Understand that. I would tell you that the practical outworking of divine sovereignty is that our God will, take, will not take no for an answer. He will not. Understand that. And what I mean by that, Jonah was free to choose to run from the presence of God, as we find indicated here in our lesson today. Uh, he was free to run from the presence of the Lord, but he was not free to choose the consequences that would come from running from the Lord. He wasn't free from that. And likewise, you and I, we can make all the choices that we want to in this world, but I submit to you that the, the consequences of those choices that we make are in the hands of Almighty God. God is the one that decides those things. Ultimately, God is the only one truly, that truly has a free will. It says in Psalm 33, 1, the counsel of the Lord standeth forever, the thought of his heart to all. And so God has the last word in every situation and God will not take no for an answer. 
You can say no if you want to, but God will not take no for an answer. Jonah 1, this chapter as we begin today, teaches us this important truth as it recounts Jonah's disobedience, his downfall, and then we see his deliverance. First of all, let's look at um, Jonah's disobedience in verse 1 and 2. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son uh, of Amittai, uh, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. Now the prophecy of, Jer- of Jonah here begins with, the Lord called a specific person to a specific place for a specific purpose. And you see, that is God's standard um, operating procedure. That's the way that God works. And there are no accidents in our lives. That's what we need to see. Our infinitely wise and our perfectly good God designs every detail of our lives in order to accomplish his eternal purpose. That's our God. God is working our lives. He's using us as his people. That's the reason why that we need to have uh, clean and fit vessels that God can use us in order to carry out his eternal purpose. It says in Jeremiah 29, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. I've got plans for you. That's what God says. I've got plans for your life. Don't think that God doesn't have a plan for your life because he absolutely has a plan for you. Notice here in verse three, Jonah's response to the plan of God for his life. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. God said go, Jonah said no. That's, that's, if you want to put it in a summary here in this first chapter, that's where it is. That's exactly what take, took place. When God called Jonah to go to Nineveh, he jumped on board of a ship going to Joppa, ultimately going to Tarshish. And Tarshish, as you know, if you studied this any length of time, you'll know that Tarshish is the absolute opposite direction of Nineveh. And so he's going the opposite direction than what God had told him to go. It's amazing to me as you look in the Old Testament, you'll find different prophets that came on the scene, such as Isaiah, you know, when the Lord said that he needed somebody to step up and do his work. And you remember what Isaiah said? Here am I, send me, Lord. I'm willing to go. And you'll find that true of the other prophets uh, recorded in the scripture here when they received the divine call of God that they went. But that's not the case with Jonah here. We'll find that when God called Jonah, he replied, here I am, Lord, send somebody else. I am not going down there to Nineveh. I'm not doing that, Lord. I, in fact, I'm going in the opposite direction as if, you know, God didn't know that was going on. Why would Jonah respond this way? I mean, why did he run? Why did he rebel? That's the questions that we ask. Why did he do that? And of course, we know that the Ninevites, if you've studied this before, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. I've, I've heard many messages and even preached some myself uh, talking about the Ninevites and the, the wicked uh, people that they were. They were brutal people. When they, uh, once they killed or once they destroyed their enemy, that many times they would skin these people and put their heads and skulls on uh, outside of uh, uh, where they lived and it would scare people that would come. They were wicked. They were brutal people. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that today. But, you know, I will tell you, God commanded jo- jo- Jonah to go and cry out to, to Nineveh, cry out against all this sin. And it's the first time and it's the only time in the scripture that God commands a prophet to go to a foreign land to declare God's message against them. This is the first time that you find. Without a, don't, without a doubt, Jonah had a list of logical reasons of why that he didn't want to go to Nineveh. So why did he do it? You know, why did, he, why did he not want to, why did he run away? Why was he a man on the run as our series uh, says today? Well, I think you'll find the reason why over in chapter four and verse two. Jonah says himself the reason why. 
Jonah chapter 4 and verse 2. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. And so Jonah's real problem was not necessarily with the Ninevites. It, in reality, it was with God. This is where he had his problem. You see, Jonah did not believe that the Ninevites deserved God's mercy. He didn't believe that. And if God was going to give these Ninevites another chance, he didn't want to have any part of it. He didn't want to be in the middle of any of that. God's going to be merciful to these people, and he, he didn't want God to be merciful to them. He didn't want to have any part of it. And so Jonah ran, the Bible says. And uh, it kind of reminds me, uh, and you'll find in that verse 3 there, he ran twice. You'll find it recorded. I'd underline it. Twice he ran. Reminds me of the psalmist. You remember what the psalmist said in uh, Psalm 139, verse 7? Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? How can I get away from the presence of God? He's saying, if I ascend up into the heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost part of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me and thy right hand shall hold me. And so friend, no matter, the psalmist says, no, no matter where I go, God, you are there. We know that our God is uh, 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 omnipresent. We know that. We know that our God is never late, never tardy, never absent. We know that God is fully present everywhere at the same time, all the time. That's our God. He's always there. There is no place you can go that you can get away from God. And if you're here today and you think you can hide from God, you're mistaken, my friend. I'm telling you, you can go all the way up to heaven and go all the way to hell and you can go in the depths of the sea and you still can't get away from God. I mean, God's the one that created it all. You're not going to get away from God. And yet Jonah foolishly determined that he was going to run from God. How can you do that? A man on the run here. And Jonah had an assignment to reach lost people that he failed to do. But you know what? You say, well, sorry, buzzard, he should have he done what God told him to do. Well, you know what? The same way God tells Jonah to go to reach these people, he's got a mission for you and I today too. Did you know that? The message is still the same today because the Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 and 20, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe whatsoever I have commanded you. Unfortunately, I would tell you that in many churches today, the Great Commission has become the great omission. That's true in this generation. You know, they, they don't take it to heart that God has told us to reach this world for Christ. Tell people about the Lord Jesus Christ. But the Lord has not rescinded his commission to the church to make disciples. He's not. We still have that today. The message of this text also applies whatever personal commission God would give you. I don't know what it might be today. It may be a call to saving faith. It may be a call to personal holiness. It may be a call to spiritual maturity. It may be a call to marital fidelity. It may be a call to Christian service. It may be a call to faithful stewardship. I don't know what it may be. But there are times when you do not know what the Lord would, uh, would have to, uh, us to do in a particular situation. We know that there are times like that. We've all faced that there are times we don't know what the Lord, particularly we have to pray about it. But that's not what this text is talking about. That's not what it's talking about. This text warns us there are times that we do know exactly what the Lord would have us to do and then we fail to do what we know is right to do. That's what this text is talking about here. And that's something that we need to learn. James 1, uh, 4, 17 says, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. It's sin, Christian, when we know to do what is right and yet we do not do what God has called us to do. That verse declares the sin of omission. God has 
certain expectations that he commands you to live out and uh, they don't apply to anyone else but you. God's called you to do this to fail to, to, and, and to fail to obey him, to obey God in that is sin. Second of all, look at Jonah's downfall. When Jonah resigned from the service of the Lord, of the service of his God, he went down to Joppa, he went down into the ship, he laid down and he went to sleep, and later he would go down into the water. He found himself in the belly of the fish is where he found himself. You see, down is the direction of disobedience. Down is the course of spiritual rebellion. Down is the way of sin. And friend, that's where the world is heading, down, down, down. And that's not what we want to do as God's people. We don't want to be going down. You cannot, re you cannot rebel against God and go up. Your life will not go up if you rebel against God. It's just a fact. The Bible says that. You think you can, you cannot. The Bible says you will not go up if you rebel against God. You will only go down. And when you disobey God, there will, will be an unavoidable downfall. You'll either fail miserably or you'll succeed miserably. One of the two. Charles Spurgeon once said, God will not let his children sin successfully. And I think that's a pretty powerful statement. But do not be deceived by favorable circumstances. You might say, well, you know, I'm not living for God, but I'm clipping along at a pretty good rate here and uh, don't seem, you know, and uh, I know God, but I'm not living for him. Well, I want you to know when, decide, when Jonah decided to run from God, everything seemed to work out that day. I mean, he was able to get his ticket and he was able to seemingly go in the direction that he wanted to go. My friend, I want you to know Jonah was on the wrong ship that day and he was heading in the wrong direction, headed for, the, for a, violent, a violent encounter with the wrath of Almighty God. It was coming. It hadn't gotten there yet, but it was coming. And I submit to you, if you're a born again Christian today and you continue to go in the direction you're going in away from God, I want you to know that that, that encounter with an Almighty God that is all powerful is yet to come. It is yet to come. Verse four, but the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea and there was a mighty tempest in the sea so that the ship was like to be broken. Now this is not an ordinary storm. It was a God sent supernatural, miraculous, uh, cataclysmic, uh, perfect storm that almost broke this ship into pieces. That's how bad it was. Sure they had experienced storms before, but this was a God sent storm that about, about destroyed them. Everybody's on deck. Everybody's out there doing what they can do. What would you do if you were in a situation like that? I promise you, you'd be doing everything you could in order to survive. Whatever it took. You had to throw everything overboard and we'll not get into all the detail of that. But uh, if you, whatever you had to do, you would do it. What was Jonah doing? While well, everybody's out there trying to save their lives, what's Jonah doing? Look there in verse six. So the shipmaster came to him and said to him, what meanest thou, O sleeper? You sorry buzzard down here laying here asleep while all of us are about to lose our life. You're down here sleeping. What's your problem, man? What's your problem here? Arise, call unto thy God, if so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. Now these pagan sailors, it's amazing here that they have more spiritual discernment than the man of God. Isn't that amazing? They know more about that they need to call out to God than what, uh, what Jonah has here. I mean, they knew something or someone was behind this storm. Something was going on here. And uh, it says there in verse seven, and they said, everyone to his fellow come and let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast lots and the lot fell upon Jonah. Now, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time in talking about the superstition of these men, but they were superstitious men. But we, of course, you and I know behind the scenes and we know that God was in control. You know, all this has taken place because of a man that's on the run. You know, a man, the, a man of God that's supposed to be doing right with God, but he's on the run. And, uh, but so when they cast lots, and of course the lots fell on Jonah. 
Jonah's unavoidable, uh, uh, unavoidable confrontation with the living God warns us that resp- uh, spiritual rebellion is costly. It's going to cost you something. Do you hear me, church? Spiritual rebellion will cost you something. You will pay a price. Because the Bible tells us in Galatians 6, 7, and we better believe it, be not deceived, God is not mocked for whatsoever man soeth, that shall he also reap. That's what the Bible tells us. We better believe it. We better believe the word of God because the word of God makes it clear and plain. God may make you pay with cash up front or he may make you pay with a credit card later on, but my friend, you're going to pay. It's going to come. The time is coming. Either way, spiritual rebellion will cost you. You see this next phrase on the screen, sin will take you farther than you want to go. You see that? It's brought up there. I want you to say it with me because you've heard that statement many times before. Let's say it together. Sin will take you farther than you want to go. Sin will keep you longer than you want to stay. And sin will cost you more than you want to pay. Boy, friend, if you want to write that down, I think you can. You've got time to do it. But that's an important statement right there because that is absolutely true. It is true. And we need to put those words in our heart and remember that. You see, Jonah paid for a ticket down to Joppa and then to Tarshish, but he never reached his destination. He never made it there. And that's what happens to you when you rebel against God. It will cost you. You think about all the money he paid for the ticket for that, that boat ride. Uh, you know, I'm sure they weren't cheap. It's kind of like airplane tickets aren't too cheap. You know, uh, I don't like it with the idea of thinking that I've bought a plane ticket and I'm, you know, can't go and not going to get my money out of it. You know, of course, plane tickets are different today. You can get insurance for it or, or you know, every airline's different today. Some you can pay a, a penalty from 100, I mean, from $50 up to 150, maybe to get it redone for a later period of time within the next year. Some of them are that way. Some of them aren't. Some of them you just lose them. And, uh, why, you know, so you can imagine it cost him here. It cost him. He paid for that. But my friend, I want you to know, uh, he paid, he paid a price uh, for this. And ironically, um, spiritual devotion, it is costly not to do what God tells us to do. But I want you to know that it's also spiritual devotion is also, also costly. I'm going to be honest with you. It's costly. You know that it costs to serve the Lord? Did you know that? It costs to serve the Lord. I mean, it costs somebody in order to start this church here. Did you know that? There's some people that had to pay a price in order for this, this church to get started here on Dundee Road and to then build these buildings that are here today. It costs somebody something. Do you know that it, we're coming up on election? Do you know that there's some people that paid a, a, a dear price in order for us to live in a free America today? And I'll tell you what, we better remind our children of that. We better remind them that there are people that died and gave their lives so we might have our freedom in this land of America. And you know, people say, well, I don't don't even think I'll vote. You better remember about those people that shed their blood that we could live in a free America. That's important. That's important, friend. Don't take those things lightly. Don't take this church lightly here, that God put this church here to do a work for God and for souls to be saved. There are people that pay the price in order for these things to be here. So I would tell you, it is costly, uh, spiritual devotion to serve the Lord. But if you obey, hear me when I tell you, God will pay you back. Did you hear me? When you give to the Lord and the price has been given, God will pay you back. Whatever it costs, he will pay you back. But when you go on your own way, it will cost you and you will never get paid for it. In fact, you will pay a a, a negative price. You'll be in the negative rather. I want you to go on and see here. And verse eight and nine, then said they unto him, tell us, we pray thee for whose cause this evil is upon us. What is thine occupation? And whence comest thou? Why, well, what is thy country? And of what people art thou? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew and I fear the Lord. <laughs> That's kind of a strange thing to say. And uh, the God of heaven, which hath made the sea and the land. 
Now you get, to me, you get a, a, a glimpse of the ironic providence of God here. This is, a, this is the hilarious part of the sermon here. It really is funny, you know, if you look at this, Jonah was on that ship because he didn't want to go and deliver God's word to those pagans down there in Nineveh. And here it is, you will find that Jonah's on the ship telling pagans about the Lord who created the sea and the dry ground. Isn't that amazing? That's hilarious to me. That's hilarious. He wouldn't go down there in Nineveh, but here it is, he's witnessing, Eve even saying that he fears God. You know, it's amazing to me. And in response, the sailors, they made a statement that really rebukes Jonah. And, uh, and I would say that it rebukes anybody that wants to play the Jonah today. And I think that our churches are full of people that are playing the Jonah. They're doing just like what Jonah did the same way. But this statement here in verse 10, I'd underline it. Why hast thou done this? These people are saying, why in the world? You know, I love our missionary, Dan Weaver. He has this statement. He says, what's up with that? You know, and he'll say it in such a flamboyant way. What's up with that? You know, <laughs> and every once in a while I'll say it back to him and he knows I'm joking with him about it, you know. But, you know, they're, I think they're a little bit more emphatic with it than in this. Why in the world would you do this thing? This is what these pagans are saying to Jonah here. Here it is. You know the Lord, who the Lord God is. Is that not what he said? Didn't Jonah say that he knew the true and living God and that he feared God? But they come back and they say, you say that you know God and that you have a personal relationship with the creator, the one who made the land, the dry, the sea and the dry land. You say that you have a relationship with this creator and you belong to the one that, that uh, knew that you were on the ship and uh, that he's a strong enough God that he uh, brought up this storm as a result of you. All these things. Why have you done this then? You know, if you, if you know all this, if you know God, why have you done this? You know, this is what I think today with people who are living in rebellion against God. You know, you just want to say the same thing. You want to tell them, look, you know, I'm talking about saved people. You know, that, that are living in sin, living in open sin. And, uh, you know, knowing who God is, you want to tell them, knowing who God is and knowing Knowing your Bible and knowing what God can do, not to mention all that God, and think about all the good things that God has done for you. You know, all these things. Why would you do this? You know, why? Just tell me a reason why. I've, I've asked that question many times. A lot of people just kind of hang their head and say, I don't know. Sometimes people get it right and sometimes they don't. It's astounding. God has to deal with them. Second century, I love the story of Polycarp, you remember? The Bishop of Smyrna, he was famously martyred. You've read his life story, many of you have. I've told it many times. The Roman authorities came along and did everything they could to make him and to make everyone say that Caesar is Lord. And he said that he would not, Polycarp would not. They didn't want to kill him. They gave him one more chance to denounce the Lord and uh, they said, uh, take the oath and we'll let you go. Uh, the proconsul said, revile Christ is what they told him. Polycarp said, his dying words were, for 80 and six years have I been his servant and he had done me no wrong and how can I blaspheme my king who saved me? Those were the last words before they took his life, a martyr for Jesus Christ. And I hope to God that nothing will keep us from serving Jesus. May we serve the Lord. Let's don't let anything get in the way of us serving God. Then last of all, look at Jonah's deliverance. In verse 11, the sailors asked Jonah one more question. They said, what shall we do unto thee that the sea may be calm unto us? Well, these sailors recognized that there was nothing that they could do uh, about the situation. I mean, they're caught in the crossfire of the conflict of between uh, a living God and a rebellious prophet. They're, they're kind of caught in crossfire. That's a bad place to be, you know? Terrible thing to be. But God made the move, and I want you to see this. God makes moves. Man tries to, God tells us what to do, but man tries to make it a chess game with God. 
And that's astounding. You think you can, you think you can play chess with God? Number one, you, you think you can play it? Number two, you think you can beat God at chess? You know? You think the God who knows all and created all, you think you can beat out God? You think you know better than God? You think you know a better move than what God has? You look at God, God made his move by commanding Jonah to go down to Nineveh. That was his move. Jonah made his move by boarding a ship and heading in the opposite direction to Tarsus. So God comes back. God makes another move by sending a storm to the sea. And it's so now it's time for Jonah to make his move. What's his move going to be? And I would tell you that as he makes this move, the fate of these sailors was contingent upon what Jonah is going to choose to do next. It's all their lives are going to depend on his choice. What he's going to decide to do. How'd you like to know that? You got a whole boatload of people and what you decide is going to determine whether they're going to live or whether they're going to die. You say, I wouldn't like to be in that situation. Well, I'll tell you what, we're all in a situation of making a choice. We're all in a situation of making a choice of living for God. And if we don't live for God, it is going to affect other people. You that are parents here, if you don't live for God, it is going to affect your children. I promise you, it is going to affect them. You that are grandparents here, if you don't live for God, it is going to affect your children and your grandchildren. It's going to affect the generations to come. It could be that there are some people that are weak here in our congregation and your decision is going to affect them of whether they continue on in serving God. You say, well, I can't help but what they do. Well, I don't want, I don't want to be a stumbling block. Isn't that what the Apostle Paul said? Look, you know, um, I'm willing to be all things, all people. I don't, want to, I don't want to do anything if it's going to be something that I feel the freedom to be able to do this. Paul would say, I feel the freedom. I have my freedom in Christ, but I'm not going to do something that's going to be a stumbling block to my brother. I'm not going to do that. Cause him to fall in the Lord. And so we have that choice. But I want you to know the choice goes both ways. If we choose to not live for God, then we are going to affect those around us in that fashion too. We affect them for good and we affect them for bad or for evil. We affect them for God or we affect them for the world, Satan, and sin. You, you want your children, your grandchildren to have a secular worldview that talks about Satan and everything that this world has to offer? Or do you want your children to have a Christian worldview that stands and believes in God and loves God and knows that God's way is the right way and will give them life and liberty and happiness and joy and peace and condemnment? That's what I want. That's what I want for my family. That's what I want for you. That's what I want for my friends. And so, you know what? I've got to accept, I've got to set the example before in these things. These things are so very important. I want you to look at Jonah's response in verse 12. Take me up and cast me forth into the sea. So shall the sea be calm unto you. For I know that for my sake, this great tempest is upon you. Now, Jonah could have made up a lot of excuses, but he knew he was the man on the run. He knew that. Jonah knew that he had sinned against Almighty God. And I want you to notice there in verse 13, nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring it up, bring to the land, but they could not for the sea wrought and was the tempest against them. Well, he had told them to go ahead and throw them in the water. But the sailors here, it says that, uh, they, uh, they went ahead, they rode, they did everything they could. In reality, they're more upright than Jonah at this point. You know, they didn't want to be murderers. They, they, didn't, want, they didn't want him to lose his life. Uh, they didn't want to be responsible for that. They tried harder to row. They, uh, but the storm got worse. You know, they're all going to lose their life. And they had no choice. Look in verse 14. Wherefore, they cried unto the Lord and said, We beseech thee, O Lord. They're calling out to God now. Uh, you know, they've not known the Lord before. They're calling out to God. We beseech thee, O Lord. Let, not, let us not perish for this man's life. And lay not upon us innocent blood, for thou, O Lord, hast done as it pleased thee. Now I want you to notice that God converted these sailors in spite of a rebellious prophet. Isn't that amazing? amazing? In spite of Jonah and his, his hypocritical, uh, backslidden state that he's in, God saved these people, these men anyhow. It's astounding. Jonah's conduct was more unethical than these uh, pagan sailors. And yet God reached around 
Jonah's hypocrisy and he saved them anyway. And you know what? There's a lesson to learn here. God's able to do that. Did you know that? God's able to do that. Don't give up. I'm, I'm telling you today, don't give up on that unbelieving child. That child that's never put their faith in Christ and the Lord, don't give up on that child. Keep on praying for them. Don't give up on that, your mate, that husband, that wife, uh, that doesn't know the Lord. Don't give up on them, the parent, your sibling, your neighbor, your, your coworker, your classmate. Don't give up on them. Keep praying for them. Keep trusting the Lord. But I will tell you, and I'm going to be very blunt about it, that God can either do it through you, and I pray that he will as you live for the Lord, or he can do it without you. God can win them either way. I'd rather him use me in order to get it done. I think you would too, amen? I mean, we all want to be used. But there's no obstacle to the plan of God, no limit to the power uh, for God's power to save. There's no, there's no limit to that. God can do it with us or without us. And so praise his holy name. Uh, verse 17. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Now funny here, Jonah thought that he was finally free from the command of God. I heard about a skeptic, and I've told you this before, story of a young lady one day she gotten saved and uh, this man, there's kind of a conversation with a man that didn't believe in God. He said, do you really believe the Bible is the word of God? Is what he said to her. Yes, I do, she answered. Do you believe all that is in God's word? And she said, yes, I absolutely do. He says, does that mean that you believe in miracles? She said, yes, I do. You mean to tell me that you believe a fish swallowed a man and kept him for three days? Absolutely, she said. He, and he said, well, how did it happen? She said, well, I don't know, but when I get to heaven, I'll, I'll find Jonah and I'll ask him how it happened. And she said, uh, the, uh, um, the man said, well, what if you get to heaven? He's not there. And the young lady said, well, then you can ask him. So she's a pretty sharp young lady, isn't she? Some have said that wells don't have a big enough mouth in order for pit humans to be able to get through and for a human to be able to stay there for three days. But you know, those arguments, you can make those arguments all day long if you want to. You know, I, I, I try to practice not getting into arguments with people. You know, it's a waste of time as far as I'm concerned. I just want to tell people about Jesus Christ. That's all I want to do. I'm not going to sit around and argue with people. You can get into those arguments if you really want to. They're not necessary for me. If the word of God uh, says that God appointed a great fish to come along and swallow a man, then I believe it. Uh, that settles it for me right there. Genesis 1-1 says what? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And my friend, if you can believe that, you can believe anything else in the Bible. So let's take it all the way back to Genesis 1-1. Let me go on record by declaring to you today that I believe the Bible. I believe all the Bible. So I believe that God appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah. And I believe that God parted the Red Sea so that the Israelites could cross uh, on dry ground. And the Bible says that after that, God let the, let the uh, sea come down and drown all the uh, Pharaoh's army there. I believe that God made the sun to stop and time to stand still in order for Joshua to finish his fight that day. The Bible said it, and I believe it. I believe that God brought the three Hebrew children down into that fiery furnace that day, and when they went in there, they wouldn't bend, they wouldn't bow, they wouldn't burn, and they came out without a smell of smoke on their clothes. I believe that. I believe that Jesus turned the water into wine, and I believe that Jesus spoke and made the winds to be quiet and the, and the waves to lie down and to be still. I believe that when Jesus spoke. And I declare to you today, my friend, that I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary and that he was buried in Joseph's tomb. And after three days and three nights, just as the scripture had prophesied and told that it would take place, that Jesus came forth from the grave and he's a resurrected savior and he lives and he sits on the right hand of the Father today. I believe that because the Bible says that that take place. And so I have no problem in believing that a great fish came along and swallowed Jonah. I have no problem with that today. In fact, all of creation obeyed God in the book of Jonah except one runaway prophet, one man that was on the run. 
everything else obey God. You look at, at all that there. Everything, the waters, the sea, the wind, and even the fish obeyed God. It was only Jonah, the backslidden prophet that was on the run, man on the run, that did not obey God. And my friend, he had to learn that God will not take no for an answer. That's what he had to learn. The great storm was an act of divine judgment against the rebellion of Jonah. But the great fish was an act of mercy. You see, the mercy of the Lord. Jonah concluded that God was trying to kill him, and so he determined he's just going to go ahead and kill himself first. But God wasn't trying to kill him. God was trying to, it was having mercy on Jonah and trying to get him to change his mind. So God appointed a great fish to come along and to swallow Jonah. That was God's great act of mercy. He was merciful. God could have dropped him dead right there on the spot. Could have had a lightning bolt come down there in that store and just take it and take him out. You know, God had mercy on him. And I want you to know that God's been merciful to us too. Has he not? And our God, a merciful God, is there anybody here that's never failed God? Don't raise your hand. Okay. <laughs> well, we'll know that you, you probably have issues. Because we all know, we're all aware that we've all failed God. But let me go on and tell you that our God's a merciful God. Oh, he's such a merciful God. Thank the Lord for that. It says in Lamentation 3, and I love these verses. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Oh, he's a merciful God. They're new every morning. Isn't that great? Every morning. When the unbelieving Jews asked Jesus for a sign that would prove the messianic credentials, his messianic credentials, Jesus did what? Gave him the sign of Jonah. Is that not true? You'll find that in Matthew chapter 12, verse 40. It says, for as Jonas, or as Jonah, was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. See, it was our Jesus already foretelling that that was yet to come. This is the Son of Man. He is the Messiah. Jesus is the Messiah. But I ask you in conclusion today, are you a man on the run? Are you a woman on the run? Are you a young person on the run today? God has spoken to you. The Holy Spirit has dealt in your life and you know that you need to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. There's no way of salvation other than Jesus Christ. There's nothing in this world that's gonna save you from your sin. Only Jesus Christ can save you. He's the only one that can give you a home in heaven. But won't you love God so much today that you wanna put your faith and trust in Him? Don't run anymore. It's no use to run. My friend, you'll lose if you run. I promise you. God wants to save any. God's not willing that any should perish. God wants to save every man. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And so friend, anybody, you can come today. Don't be on the run anymore. Come, call Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Then I ask you the question that you Christians, born again Christians, Know the Lord. You put your faith and trust in Christ. Are you a man on the run? Are you a woman on the run today? Are you a young person that's on the run? You're not living for God. You're a thought. You get up every day. You don't read your Bible. You don't pray. You don't think about the things of God. You're not a witness for the Lord. If you are, you're a negative witness rather than a positive witness for the Lord. And uh, you're living a life of sin. You're a person on the run today. You need to get it right with the Lord. God found Jonah right where he was. And I promise you, he will find you right where you are.